In downtown Vancouver, women were going missing. Meanwhile, outside of town, wild parties were being thrown on a pig farm by a multimillionaire. Today, we will discuss what these two stories have in common. My name is Sophia Talley, and this is True Crime Inc. Robert William Pictum, known as Willie, was born in October 24, 1949 in British Columbia. Willie had a very unorthodox upbringing. His parents, Leonard and Louise Pictum, owned a pig farm just east of Vancouver, where they raised their two sons, Willie and David. They had an oldest child named Linda, but she was sent to live in Vancouver because they felt it was unfair for a girl to grow up on a pig farm. Which is weird, especially when it's revealed that both Willie and David worked relentlessly on the farm their whole childhood. So it doesn't seem like they were too worried about their two sons. But but Willie and David were pretty much used as free labor and they were just not taken care of. They often went to school in the same clothes that they worked in. Just in case you never seen or smelled a pig farm, it's a very messy job and that's putting it very lightly. It's hard manual labor with lots of dirt and mud and manure. There's a town by me that is known for raising pigs. And oh my goodness, on a hot day, when the wind's blowing just right, it just smells really bad. So the fact that these kids would then go into school with pig clothes, which include manure uh, and bloodstains because they also would slaughter the pigs. It wasn't a surprise that they were ostracized from the rest of the class. The other kids will call them names like Stinky Piggy and Both brothers just had a hard time making friends in school. Willie's mother, Louise, was in charge of bringing up the children and managing their work on the farm. Leonard was both physically and emotionally abusive to his sons. Linda, who grew up elsewhere, has a more positive relationship with her father. And so Louise just took over as the boy's only caregiver. As a result, Willie never learned how to deal with his emotions because Louise just wasn't really emotionally available. There are stories of whenever Willie wanted to hide from people, he would hide within the slaughtered carcass of a pig. In one story, Willie recounts that as a teenager, he purchased his own calf with his own savings, and the calf became his own pet and possibly even his only friend. He loved this calf so much. And for those who don't know, cows can be really affectionate to their caregivers. It's just really sweet. They make really good pets if you have a farm. And one day after school, Willie couldn't find his calf anywhere. His mother told him to check the barn. And there was his pet calf hanging in the barn, slaughtered like meat. The experience completely gutted Willie. And as an adult, he often told this story to anyone who would listen to him. In school, Willie was placed in special ed classes, and he never was interested in school at all. And so he dropped out in 1963 at the age of 14 to work as a butcher's apprentice. On the evening of October 16th, 1967, his younger brother David just got his driver's license and took his father's truck out for a drive. Tragedy struck when the truck hit 14-year-old Tim Barrett, who lived in the same neighborhood as the Pictons. Tim was badly injured, but still alive, and so Dave ran home to ask his mother for help. Louise returned to the scene of the accident with Dave, and she looked at Tim's injuries before pushing him and shoving him down this steep hill that was at the side of the road where his body splashed into the watery depths of the swamp. 
below. Dave panics and quickly gets the truck repaired at a local mechanics to hide the evidence. Soon, the truth is partially revealed when the boy's body is found. An autopsy reveals that he died from drowning, not from injuries sustained from the car accident. This shows that they were looking for a murderer because it was clear that someone didn't move his body into the swamp. Using witness testimonies, including one collected from the mechanic, Dave was sent to juvie. But Louise's involvement in the murder was not revealed until the 90s when Willie would tell this story to his friends. So Dave took all of the responsibility for it. I just want to share this story because it shows the type of upbringing that the boys had. Louise's actions tells the story of a heartless mother who would hurt others if it meant that her child would be protected. It shows a type of terrifying love that just feels unreal. I just feel like this particular story sounds like something that you would hear in an HBO show, not in a quaint farming community. In 1970, Willie was ready to move on from his butcher apprenticeship and worked on the family farm full time. Until his adulthood, he was terrified of showers, and so he wasn't allowed to take showers as a kid, only baths. Why? We don't know, but his mother insisted that he only take baths. And then when he became an adult, he was just afraid of showers, and he would only bathe when people around him would nag him to do so. In 1978, Willie's father died, and the next year, in 1979, his mother died as well. The farm was then ran by Willie and Dave, and everyone who visited said that the farm looked very creepy and it was poorly taken care of, but in 1994, the Pictons got extremely lucky. Their farmland was now valued at $7.2 million, and so the brothers downscaled the pig farm, then sold parcels of their land to a townhouse developer. And two more parcels to the city of, I'm going to butcher this, Port Coquilem, Coquitlam, Coquitlam, to be used as a park in elementary school. In total, by 1995, the Pictons were worth approximately $5.2 million, and they were not shy about their money. With his share of the earnings, Dave left a family farm and took up residence only a mile away where he opened a party hall, Piggy's Palace Good Time Society. Piggy's Palace was actually registered as a nonprofit charity that would host wild parties and sporting events and dances and pretty much any social gathering on behalf of service and sports organizations. 2,000 people would attend these parties at once, and it was utter chaos. These parties were a mixed bag. They would attract Hell's Angel bikers, mayors, soccer moms, children, literally every type of person attended these parties. They seemed to have no rules and their stories of bouncers beating up guests just for sport and amidst the chaos would be Willie either tending to a roasting pig on a spit or carving the meat himself with reportedly dirty fingers for thousands of his guests to enjoy. Here's a description of a Halloween party hosted at Piggy's Palace, as told by an unnamed partygoer. I arrived at the party at about 9 p.m. It was dark and raining and muddy, and there were lots of motorcycles, old cars, and a big pig roasting on a spit. There were kids in costumes, some dressed as witches. The little kids were running around and playing in the dark. There wasn't much light. There were lots of women who looked like hookers. The party spilled all over the grounds and there were people in the house and in the trailer doing the wild thing. I recall walking by a shack with a 40 watt light bulb hanging over the door and machinery was running inside. Here I got a death chill. The hairs raised on the back of my neck and my feet froze to the ground. I didn't want to be there anymore, so I left and walked home. End quote. 
Despite this insanity, these parties continued. In 1997, a woman flagged down a car with handcuffs hanging from run wrist and stab wounds. A passing car called an ambulance and she was taken to a hospital where she underwent emergency surgery. While she was in the surgical theater, guess who was getting treated for stab wounds in the same hospital? Willie Pickton. An orderly put two and two together, found a key in Willie's pocket, and found that this key fit the handcuffs that were still hanging on the woman's wrist. Later, the woman told her side of the story. She was a sex worker. Her name is heavily protected, thankfully. She went to the Picton's home for work. And while she was there, he tried to handcuff her wrist together. But she was on to him. And she grabbed a nearby kitchen knife to defend herself. They both struggled However, the woman was able to get away and flag down a passing car for help. Willie was arrested and charged with attempted murder, assault with a weapon, and forcible confinement. Unfortunately, the charges were dropped because the woman that he attacked was addicted to drugs and because of this, police considered her to be an unreliable witness. This is absolutely crazy because she was literally stabbed nearly to death by this man it was clearly him who did it his key fit her handcuffs but the problem with this story is that it was his story against hers and Willie who was a multi-millionaire who parties with mayors claimed that she was a hitchhiker who attacked him first this makes absolutely no sense because where do the handcuffs come from does he just keep handcuffs in his car just for rowdy hitchhikers? It just doesn't make any sense. If you have handcuffs, there's usually intent there. Despite stabbing this woman, Willie walked free without the public knowing that he was an attempted murderer. And yes, he continued hosting politicians and Hells Angels bikers at his parties after this. Life just went on for Willie while his victims just watched. But more weird things were happening on the east side of Vancouver, a shady side of town that was not too far from where Willie lived. So today's knitter mission, I just want to talk about how I have been working tirelessly away at creating as many sweater designs as I can. I have been working really hard to get my next pattern out, which is called the Rainbow Gan. And then I am working on my latest pattern as we speak right now. Hopefully my knitting isn't being picked up by the microphone. And this pattern is a circular yoke pattern that features a like really cool garter stitch color work um, that's completely randomized. And so the knitter can just have fun and knit their colors, as many colors and how and whichever way you like to your heart's content and this design is going to be graded from a uh, baby to adult it's going to be gender neutral it's great great gift giving and it's going to be released before the holiday season so that way you may have time to knit one for a friend also before i end this knitter mission i know it was a short one just because the story had a lot going on in it but i did want to talk about how i will be taking a two-week break for our mid-season finale so that way I can work on having some more guests on the show. And so next episode will be up in two weeks. So the next episode will be up on the 8th. Just want to thank everyone for listening to this mid-season finale. It, I did so much work to get to these five, to, to get to this fifth episode. One of the reasons why I told this story is because I saw one of 
the victim's children were on TikTok. She's an adult woman now. And she was talking about how her mother was one of the victims and how it was devastating and completely horrible and traumatizing for her family. And at the time, I've never heard of this case, or rather, I did hear, I did hear of this case, but I had a hard time finishing it. So if I'd seen an article on it, I wouldn't be able to finish the article. If I listened to a podcast, I wouldn't be able to finish it. If I watched a video, same thing, I wouldn't be able to finish it. And that's why I decided to take on this case today because I wanted to tell it in a way that I think it deserved to be told. I feel like when it's being, t- when it's told, it's told in a really like horror movie ask very like oh this is chilling this is creepy this is scary versus this is a terrible thing that happened to real people and that we should be working to prevent this from happening again and so that's why I decided to take this one on because I just really want to spread the message of this can still happen today and what can we do as a group as a society to prevent this from happening So that way these families don't have to move on without their matriarch or their loved one. And so that's why I decided to do that case. And now let's get back to the story. In downtown Eastside Vancouver from 1978 to 2001, 65 women were reported missing. Many of the missing women were of indigenous background. I did a two-part episode about Tina Fontaine and Rosenda Strong and the missing and murdered indigenous women movement. And in that episode, I talked about how because of generations of cultural genocide, indigenous women have a high chance of being a victim of a violent crime. It didn't help that police just believe that these women were transient and did not want to be found by their families. Actually, many of the victims were mothers who were just trying to support their children. This includes Georgina Faith Papin, who was reported missing in 2001. Georgina was a 34-year-old mother of seven, and she struggled with addiction for many years. She grew up in the foster care system along with dozens of other children who were displaced by the institutionalized racism. Brenda Ann Wolf was working as a waitress and a bouncer at a local restaurant. She was not a prostitute, but in a twist of events, she worked to protect prostitutes when they were being attacked. Something that even the police wouldn't do. So it was a surprise to her family and friends when she went missing. She was last seen in February of 1999. When Mona Lee Wilson was a child, she was found in a treatment center, brutally beaten in a hallway. She was placed in foster care, and though her first placement was loving and nurturing, her next placement was anything but. Two years later, at the age of 16, Mona was living on her own and was addicted to heroin. She worked as a sex worker to feed her addiction. She went missing in November 2001 at the age of 26. So many of these women went missing that other sex workers began to panic. In December 1995, a local sex worker named Sarah DeVries wrote in her diary, Am I next? Is he watching me now, stalking me like a predator in its prey, waiting, waiting for some perfect spot, time, or my stupid mistake? How does one choose a victim? Good question. If I knew, I would never get snuffed. A few years later, in April 1998, Sarah also went missing. These disappearances, though, did not go unnoticed. In 1978, Vancouver police set up a missing women task force, which compiled a list of 
all of the reported missing women in the area. But the problem here is that though a list was made, nothing much was done besides that. Vancouver police was just not making any progress on any of these cases. And there were several reasons for that. One is that the police just gave a low priority to crimes committed against sex trade workers. It just wasn't seen as an important matter for them, which is insane because sex work is real work and it does not make these women any less human or unworthy of justice. Also, the Vancouver police was just behind on the times. They weren't using psychological criminal profiling, geoprofiling, or other new investigation methods. Though these methods were fairly new at the time, they were still being used with great success across the border in the U.S. And to make matters worse, the police just refused to acknowledge that these missing women were most likely deceased victims of a serial killer. To the police, poor women and sex workers are more prone to drug addiction, which leads to drug overdoses. The thing is, though this may be true, or this is true, when someone overdoses, their body isn't normally concealed or hidden. They're usually identified as a Jane Doe or identified by the family. And what I'm trying to say here is that usually there's a body when this happens. So it makes no sense that these women who supposedly died of overdoses just vanished. If they overdosed and died, then where were their bodies? The family of these women, though, many of which who were now orphaned children, were left to pick up the pieces. In 1991, these families established an annual remembrance walk on Valentine's Day to honor their missing loved ones and to get police attention. But it would be another decade until police would even look into their direction. However, there was one detective named Lorimer Schenher who went out of his way to get these disappearances noticed by his superiors. He had inside knowledge about the danger of sex work in downtown east side vancouver because in the early 90s he used to go undercover as a sex worker in order to catch violent clients in the act yes he would dress up as a woman he'll wear a short mini skirt he do his makeup and then he will stand there and take up the post as a sex worker while doing this, Lormer noted that the police just did not care about the safety of their sex workers. He says, I felt I was a man observing the situation, but also living as a woman herself. I couldn't put up with the oppression and sexism the women faced. I had a lot of anger around it, end quote. So when these women went missing, Lorimer, who had contacts and first-hand experience, worked tirelessly to find the perpetrator on his own. In 1998, an anonymous caller informed him that Willie Pinkton had a meat grinder and would brag to friends that it was a good way to dispose of a body. This, along with the fact that Willie had a dropped attempted murder charge, just made Lorimer believe that this could be his guy. The same caller, who I believe may have been Bill Hiscox, who was an employee of the Pictons, and the reason why I say believe, because some sources name him and some just say he's unnamed, which could be because he may have been unnamed while the case was unfolding and then named after the case unfolded to say it without spoiling anything so that's why i believe it's bill hills cox but i can't be sure and then bill had another story he told Lorimer that a woman named Lisa Yelds, who were friends of Willie, told him, so she told Bill, that she saw women's clothing, purses, and IDs stashed at the pig farm. And Bill thought that these had to belong to the women that were turning up missing in the area. The problem was that Lorimer couldn't do anything about it because he 
was Vancouver police, and the Picton farm fell into the jurisdiction of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, also known as RCMP. And when he presented his findings to the RCMP, they were just not interested in the case at all. In spring of 1999, in spring of 1999, Lorimer is told by a friend named Lynn Ellenson that she saw a woman's body hanging in Picton Slaughterhouse from a meat hook. At first, she did not want to cooperate with the police, possibly because Picton was one of her sources of income. Lynn was also a known addict, and so the police just at first didn't see her as a reliable witness. But then when she described that because the body was hanging and Picton was processing it as if it was meat, like a pig, she mentioned that the fat she saw was yellow. And the thing is, pig fat is white. But the fact that she saw yellow fat made her story more believable and made the police realize, hey, something may be going on here. Because she did not know that human fat was yellow and pork fat was white. She just saw yellow fat and was sure something was weird. It did not look like a pig carcass. Still, Larmer continued to gather evidence, but by the year 2000, he was understandably burnt out. He suffered from PTSD and had to be transferred to a different unit. It was just too much for him not having support from his superiors while he knew there was an active serial killer on the loose. Finally, that next year in 2001, RCMP assigned a task force to investigate the disappearances. They called this task force Project Evenhanded, and they actually began to make progress on the course fairly quickly. In February 2002, another employee had some more incriminalizing information about the pit dens. This employee actually saw illegal guns being kept at the home. This, believe it or not, was not enough to get a search warrant. Despite the fact that there was no hard evidence of these illegal weapons, on, so on February 5th, 2002, the Picton's property was raided. Not only did they find the illegal weapons, but also the purses and IDs and clothing that we mentioned earlier. And it did not take them long to realize that these items did in fact belong to some of the missing women. So the police could not arrest Willie in connection to the missing women case because they did not have enough evidence, but they were able to arrest them for having illegal weapons. This is mind blowing. But anyway, they were able to arrest him. And because he is stupid rich at this point, he was able to pay his bail and was released from jail and while he was released the police prohibited him from entering the pig farm and they kept him under 24 7 surveillance and they did this because they were searching the farm for more evidence the pig farm became the largest crime scene in Canadian history with 200,000 DNA samples and 600,000 exhibits. This includes the remains of 33 female victims. 33 victims. That is an unbelievable amount of people. The investigation cost about 70 million Canadian dollars, partly because investigators had to sift through 383,000 cubic yards of soil. And they also found night vision goggles, fur line handcuffs, a syringe. They believe that this syringe may have been filled with windshield washer fluid and they think this because there's a video of a friend a willies saying that willie told him that the best way to murder a female drug addict was to inject her with windshield cleaning fluid 
With this hard evidence, Willie was arrested and charged with a total of 26 murders, which is not that bad considering they found 33 people. Usually that number could be as low as like two or four just because of lack of evidence, especially since these crimes went back for decades. But fearing that this man could have killed even more, a police officer went undercover and posed as Willie's cellmate. This incredibly dangerous stunt worked, and Willie began to confess to more killings. He admitted to murdering 49 women, and before he was caught, he was trying to make it to 50 victims. The trial began on January 30th, 2006. They tried to charge him with 27 counts of murder, but this was rejected by the judge due to lack of evidence. So prosecutors decided to break up the charges. They would at first try to charge him for six counts and then try to prosecute for 20 more. I'm going to assume here that one count of murder just didn't have sufficient evidence and they just kind of dropped that one, which is really sad. So you might be wondering here, hey, Sophia, where where did all the evidence go? How come they didn't have enough evidence to pin him, especially when they found the remains of 33 women? Well, I'm not going to go into the gruesome detail, but if you Google this case, every news outlet put the inhuman method that Willie used to dispose of the bodies in their headlines for shock value. So I am just going to explain very plainly what happened so that way you are aware, but I will not be sensationalizing it or adding anything to it as so many have done before me. Willie would first lure these sex workers to come into his house. Then he would kill them either by strangulation or injecting them with the windshield cleaner. Then he would hang up their body and butcher them as if they were one of his pigs. Next, he would either grind up the remains and feed them to his pigs or mix the remains with the leftovers from his butchered pigs to sell to a processing plant. If you butcher animals, there are leftovers like entrails that aren't usually eaten. These are then sold to a processing plant that would then turn them into restaurant grease, lipstick, soaps, other cosmetics, things like that. And then these products would be distributed across the world. So he was able to make these women disappear without a trace. So at this time, there was a scare that not only did the people at this party eat pigs that consumed human flesh, but also some speculated that Willie may have mixed the remains into meat that would then go on to be sold as food. So it's just terrible, terrible stuff. What's also heartbreaking is that when you look up this story, it is just, you know, tacking on catchy names to Willie or like, like the murderous butcher or something stupid. I don't even care. And they would just talk about these victims as a whole and not even mention names or personal stories. It just makes me sad. And that that's just how everyone chooses to report on this case. Like those women were real people, but I'll get into that later. So Willie got so much attention that when he was found guilty of the second degree murder of six people and punished with a life sentence with no possibility of parole, you know, he was sitting in jail with all this time. And so he decided to tell his side of the story. And he did this by writing a memoir and he managed to get this manuscript smuggled out of the jail and then published and sold on Amazon. Of course, the publisher in Amazon took it down, but people wanted to read it and this story made headlines as well. Like why it made headlines, I don't know. I don't know why anyone cared to hear his side of a story just because his side doesn't matter. And of course, Willie tried to appeal a few times, but each time the appeals were thrown out. Interestingly enough, the prosecution even tried to appeal an effort to get him convicted of first degree murder, despite his punishment staying the same. And this effort almost derailed 
everything as it could have potentially revealed errors made in the courtroom that could in fact jeopardize the original ruling and then potentially call for a retrial. The families were mad because it didn't make any sense to poke the situation even more, especially when it could ruin everyone's hard work. And yes, Robert Picton was only charged for six counts of second degree murder. There was just not enough evidence against them. And that is the story of Nightmare at the Pig Farm. For more information, such as show notes and my sources, please visit www.thedrunkknitter.com.